You're listening to the Hayek Program Podcast. This podcast includes audio from lectures, interviews, and discussions from scholars and visitors of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. To learn more about the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. To learn about graduate student fellowship opportunities with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University for students at Mason as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. Let's go ahead and get started today. Thank you all for coming to uh, the last series of events for the PPE workshop this semester, our book panel on Pete Becky's uh, book, F.A. Hayek. Economics, Political Economy, and Social Philosophy. The book came out in the Great Thinkers series with Palgrave Macmillan in 2018. Uh, and we're um, honored today to have Pete as well as three panelists talk about the book. Um, first, Pete Becky is the University Professor of Economics and Philosophy at George Mason University and Director of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center. He's the author of numerous books and articles and has developed a robust and progressive research program in political economy focusing on the advancement of ideas grounded in the Austrian, Virginia, and Bloomington schools of political economy. The book on F.A. Hayek is part of that Great Thinkers series that I mentioned, and it explores the life, work, and continued relevance of an Austrian-British economist, political economist, and social philosopher, Friedrich Hayek. It's set within the context of the recent financial crisis alongside a renewed interest in Hayek and the Hayek-Keynes debate and talks about that continued relevance and what we can continue to do in a research project for Hayek. The panelists that we have today are Bruce Caldwell, the re a research professor of economics at Duke University and director of the Center for the History of Political Economy at Duke. He is the general editor of the University of Chicago's The Collected Works of F.A. Hayek and is currently working on a bi biography of Hayek. He is also the author of Hayek's Challenge, which was published in 2004 with University of Chicago Press. Sandra Pert is the Dean of the Jepson School of Leadership Studies at the University of Richmond. She's the co-author of Escape from Democracy, The Role of Experts and the Public in P Economic Policy with David Levy that came out in, from Cambridge in 2016. And Paul Lewis, who's the Professor of Political Economy at King's College London and has written important work on the role of emergence in Hayek's work. All of these thinkers have done quite a bit in the history of economic thought, and particularly that of Austrian tradition and Hayek, so we're looking forward to getting to hear their comments today. We'll start with Pete, and then go on to Bruce, Sandra, and Paul, and we'll then join for Q&A. So I hope you stay as cool as possible, and we'll start the discussion now. Okay. Thanks, Stephanie. I greatly appreciate um, the opportunity to talk to you about my book and to hear from uh, such uh, distinguished uh, um, panelists um, and I'm, I, I, this is a PowerPoint uh, presentation. I'm going to try to go through it relatively quickly so that I can leave time for the speakers rather than take up all the time. Um, and that's not easy for me to do. Um, and, and so uh, I will try to do this. But uh, that's the title of the, the cover of the book. And uh, uh, this is the dedication page. And I, I, uh, Stephanie already mentioned that the book is written in this series. The Great Thinkers of Economics. When I sat down to write the book, um, I uh, very much wanted to um, uh, write the book with a sense of gratitude and a sense of promise. Uh, gratitude to my teachers um, that created an environment which I've inherited. Uh, gratitude to my colleagues uh, that have helped uh, build this program in, in particular in that I consider myself the luckiest academic in the world because I get to work with uh, three of my what were once my former students and now my cherished friends and, and co-workers, such as Pete Leeson and Chris Coyne and Virgil Storr. I get to work with uh, people that I considered when I was the graduate student's age here's legends uh, that I, that in Larry White and in w and Richard Wagner. And I get to work with phenomenal colleagues, um, you know, Paul Alajiko, who I've been working with for many years on things, uh, Jamie Lemke, Stephanie, uh, Bobby, uh, all of you, I apologize if I miss anyone. Um, and it's just amazing. I walk into this building every single day since we moved into it in 2015 with a smile from one ear to the other ear. Even when things are kind of bad, I just smile and look at like what we have and say, mm -hmm, okay. Um, and uh, I should point out before I get started that at the founding of this project, Jamie put together a lunch among the faculty 
and you know Bobby and Dick and, and, and Dragos and others were all there. And we talked about how to maybe like conceive of the project. And then at the very end of the project, after it was all done, and I should point out, this book never would have been done without the help of uh, Ennio and Rosalino, um, who were constant research assistants throughout the process of putting it together. But we also sat down with all the graduate students. Many of you were here, Scott King and your whole cohort. And we went through the entire manuscript. And it took a great shape in that. And so I, I really want to acknowledge all of that. Of course, all remaining errors get allocated to the highest bidder, uh, uh, as opposed to me. But uh, really, what I wanted to do when I started, when I got to doing the book, was to highlight uh, this aspect of the Center for the Study of Market Processes. So this is a picture from 1983. It's before I started graduate school. But when they found at the PhD program at George Mason University, the first public lecture that was given was by F.A. Hayek. Um, he gave two lectures in those short, uh, first th those years, and, uh, and Don Lavoy, who's the second one uh, from my, uh, what is that, I don't know, second one in from the left, uh, from this side, uh, right behind Hayek, uh, he is, was my teacher, um, and uh, he was the founding sort of inspiration in a lot of ways of what we try to do here in our program. Karen Vaughn was the one who made it all possible, um, and Rich Fink. Um, who was the original star, uh, start at the center. And without these people, and one of the key things about what they did was they dealt with Hayek's ideas not as either sacred texts to be worshipped or a closed chapter in history of economic thought. But from day one, they taught us that what mattered wasn't so much what Hayek said, but what Hayekian ideas can do and where they can go. And I tried to write this book in that spirit for this series. Um, whether I succeed or not, uh, I don't know, but that was my idea. So the main idea was to demonstrate the evolutionary potential of Hayekian ideas for re research in the social sciences and the humanities today. Um, and the way I tried to do that was to communicate uh, as, as coherently as I could the continuing evolution of Hayek's research program through his careers in response to intellectual debates he was engaged in as well as the historical challenges that he faced of his time. So Hayek is a product of the 20th century. The 20th century never disappears for him in terms of the debates that are important at the time. And so I'm not going to go into this here, but this is a more of a, of a deeper methodological point about uh, two articles. I'll just mention them very quickly. One of them is by George Stigler, which is, Does Economics Have a Useful Past? And, does, and then McCloskey does the past have a useful economics? And what I try to do in the book is answer in the affirmative to Stigler's question and in the affirmative to McCloskey's question, and in response, see the evolution of a research program. OK. So this title here, The Quest for Exact Thinking in Demented Times, it's a play on a book by uh, Carl Zygmunt. Uh, which is about the origins of uh, logical positivism. And he calls it the quest for, the Vienna Circle is the quest for exact thinking in these demented times. Hayek comes out of those demented times. That is the, the period in Findesickel Vienna to the, the 1930s. If you want to get a real good window on this, there's a great book by Stefan Zwig called The World of Yesterday, which talks about what happens in Viennese culture and this is the background against which Hayek is writing. World War I, Depression, World War II, the Cold War. And take a good look at that figure over there. We hammered away at that figure for a long time. What we're trying to do here is modest estimates, high estimates of the death toll due to isolating these factors of World War I, World, uh, World War II, Soviet communism, uh, uh, and, and, and then you know, and fascism and whatnot. And what you look at this is that that is the demented times. This is man's inhumanity against man. And Hayek is writing against that. The stakes are really, really high. Uh, for anyone who cares and wants to go around this building with me, I'll point out that that quote from Mises is our motivation. Uh, the quote inside from Hayek about the idea that uh, you know, the economist is only a good economist. The, the, the economist cannot just be an economist, but has to be greater than an economist. That's, uh, Hayek, that's our motto. And then if you go into the Buchanan room and you see how you operationalize that, that's our mission. 
And I, I, I'll say that till I'm blue in the face with a smile from ear to ear every day. But Hayek's unique answer, its unique answer um, was that there became an alliance that threatened to turn the social scientists into tyrants and destroyers of civilization. And that alliance is the alliance between statism and scientism. And so in, in fact, dealing with the, exact, the quest for exact thinking in demented times, when people turned to the idea of statism and scientism, what they produced as an unattended consequence of that was that chart over there. And Hayek is agitating against that. He wants to have a social science which rejects these. And so that the economist is not a tyrant or a destroyer of civilization, but instead a student of civilization. So what I try to do in the book is develop the arc of Hayek's career. And again, I, I want to turn as much as time over as possible to these three. So I'm going to go through this really quick. But I divide the, the period of his career. It's awful hard, <clears throat> right, when you're dealing with someone who starts writing in the 1920s and ends at the 19, end of the 1980s. That's a long career. Okay? But, and these dates don't exactly always line up. But basically, the first period of time is from roughly 1920 to 1940, is Hayek developing his economics as a coordination problem research program. And then from 1940 to 1960, is Hayek developing his abuse of reason project. And then from 1960 to 1980, is Hayek developing his restatement of liberal principles of justice and political economy. And then uh, in uh, post-1980, you have uh, uh, more and more focus on the philosophical anthropology of man and the conflict that he sees between our uh, evolutionary past or the moral, moral intuitions that are hardwired into us from our evolutionary past and the moral demands of the great society and the conflict between the two of those. I don't talk that much in the book about this because I talk mainly about the first three. And the reason for that is very simple, is that what I'm trying to do, because it's an argument that I want to hand off to you guys, is I want to try to explain to the reader how Hayek is compelled throughout his career to keep asking deeper and deeper questions about the institutional framework and why the institutional framework is important for our study of society. And so if Buchanan is right or others that economics is about exchange and the institutions within which exchange takes place, which I think is a shared view with, Buchan with, with Hayek, the catalactic approach, economics about exchange and the institutions within which exchange takes place, part of the arguments in the debate that Hayek is always forced to and com compelled to engage in is a deeper appreciation of that institutional framework. I think this is very, very easily seen even in the most basic rendering of the economic calculation argument. Uh, just simply take a present value calculation and do it. Simple as present value calculation. Now think about all the institutions that have to be working in order for that present value calculation to actually have any meaning. Right? You have to have security of property rights. Right? because otherwise the risk varies is going to change. You're going to have to have sound money. Otherwise, right, the interest rate's going to have to be adjusted in order to take into account inflation. Right, you're going to have to have fiscal responsibility so that you actually have hard budget constraints. All of those things are necessary, even to do the simplest thing like a present value calculation. Now, blow that up to all kinds of various things in modern capitalism. And what, was so, what the socialists were arguing is that you could have those consequences without those institutions. You could have those consequences without those institutions in economics, and you could have those consequences without those institutions in politics. And what he's saying is, you can't get that. And part of his argument is that, so that puts the primacy on the institutional framework, and unlike his other rediscoverers of institutions in the post-World uh, post War II period, Hayek doesn't limit his analysis to incentive institutionalism. He, he asks the question not just how do the institutions structure incentives, but how do the institutions impact our learning environment? All right, our learning environment. This is what I call in the book epistemic institutionalism or epistemic properties of alternative institutions. And that's what I want 
the reader to get out of it because that's the research program that I think you can go forward with. You can study how alternative institutional environments affect the way in which individuals learn how to realize productive, uh, uh, productive specialization and, social, and peaceful social cooperation with one another. So the book is, is uh, made up of these 11 chapters. I put a star next to the preface because the preface is not a normal preface. This was the, one of the biggest errors in writing. The preface is really the overview of the entire book. So if you read the preface, you kind of know the book. You can put it away. I can't tell you that because it costs a lot of money. But the preface is basically this. So it's kind of interesting because we're having your conversation about your book, and you say in your note to everyone, we're not going to write the introduction or the conclusion until we get done, which is the way most of us write books. I did write those, and then I didn't have a preface. <laughs> so my preface became my introduction. So don't do that. Follow Bruce better. Uh, and, uh, and so that is one of the, the things about it. But the book goes through in chronological order of Hayek's career, basically. It starts out with, with some background, but then it deals with his work on money and business cycles. Um, he's a microeconomist all the way through. So while he's doing macroeconomics, it follows the standard Garrison, Roger Garrison line, which is there may be macroeconomic problems, but there's only microeconomic explanations. And so he's a, he's a price theoretic uh, theorist of the, of the anatomy of a crisis. Then we get the price system. Then we get the debate with socialism. Then we get the genuine institutional economics. If I was to say what... Um, what chapter is the one that I want you to read the most? It's actually I'm building towards this chapter. Because the genuine institutional economics is the research program that I want you to go forward with. So I would go here, and then I would go here, and then the reconstruction of a liberal project, but that's a whole other uh, story. All right, some additional unique features of the book. So in the process of doing the book, we did a full citation study of Hayek. This is the Contra Abner uh, offer uh, study. Um, and showing the impact of Hayek's work. I'll just let you look at that. Uh, we did a Hayek family tree. Um, we found a missing limb of that tree, which was his Freiburg students, and we're going to try to fix that over here. Uh, we do have a full and complete professional timeline of Hayek. But one of the things that's fascinating is we did collect a living bibliography of the works on Hayek, uh, NEO got to know the librarians at the London School of Economics very well, trying to determine whether or not GLS Shackle is a student of Hayek's or not, uh, you know, these, all these different kind of things. And uh, it actually ran longer than the book, so the publisher didn't like that. Uh, so it's now a living bibliography that's online. And all of you, this is actually, like, really cool. I get jazzed about this. Uh, right, Stephanie, <laughs> is because it's an emergent property, this living bibliography, which is exactly what the book is trying to get you to do to contribute to the ongoing research program in Hayekian political economy. And when you do, you get to be part of the living bibliography. Like, how cool is that? It's like self-enforcing, right? This is like me giving, like, you know, it's like with my dog. I give him, like, treats, and he comes back for more treats. <laughs> so <laughs> living bibliography, there it is. Probably shouldn't have said that. All right, so... <laughs> Some missed opportunities. There's definitely missed opportunities in the book. I'm the first one to admit it, because I have a, a narrative structure that I'm trying to do. And I'm very at pains in the beginning of the book to tell you it's not a proper intellectual history. It's not a clash of economic ideas like Larry White's book, which actually weighs both sides. I'm telling the story of modern economics from the point of view of one perspective. And I'm giving that perspective many different bites of the apple when countered with arguments. It's just the evolution of one argument to try to get you. But what do I miss? There's a kind of a, a really big question in Hayek's career, which is early Hayek, and in particular Hayek all the way up to the counter-revolution of science, is what I would argue a methodological dualist, in which the fact that the human sciences are different from the natural sciences is a very big part of the picture. But later in life, it, it, that's not the emphasis that he stresses. He stresses instead the difference between sciences of complexity and science of simplicity. And I don't address that transformation of Hayek's thought because I'm pushing this idea of the, of the human sciences kind of idea. And so I'm very vulnerable on that idea. And as a result, I don't give enough credit to Hayek's sensory order, um, which is uh, in, the, in the book. It doesn't play as, as significant a role as it could in other narratives. If 
But if you go back and you're focused on this, I've made a, an argument that the sensory order doesn't really help me here. So someone would have to prove that to me in order for me to emphasize it. In Hayekian studies, this is a big miss. In Hayekian political economy, I'm unpersuaded still to this day. I also don't make as much out of philosophical anthropology of Hayek's as I should. I have some passages of that, and that's because this extended order in the liberal project is a huge problem that we face. And how does our evolutionary pass and group selection kind of ideas? So again, I think that, that uh, 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 another take at this project would have emphasized those two things. Complexity and emergence as opposed to subjectivism and human sciences, and uh, more about this issue of group selection and our evolutionary past and overcoming that for that. Instead, when I push to this, I just make an argument for uh, basically cosmopolitan liberalism, um, which again, it, and it harks back to, to Robbins as much as it does to Hayek. So I'm re trying to recapture something that was before all of these arguments. Um, OK, so what's the continuing relevance? The way I see it is, first and foremost, for those of you who are economics, is Hayek, which all of you are, <laughs> Hayek is an economist. And he's an economist whose time has not yet come, Re meaning that he is an economist that wrote in the 20th century, but is a 21st century economist, because economic theory hasn't yet caught up to his understanding of the price system and the dynamics of the market. And so it's back on to you guys to develop an ongoing research project on the epistemic properties of a market economy. The second question is, and dynamics of adjustment. The second one is development of a genuine institutional economics. Not old institutionalism, not neo-institutionalism, but Hayekian institutionalism. But it's like this working together of these different research programs together would be, uh, you know, that program. And neither one of them is, in, is good enough on their own. But it's in filling in the gaps in each of them on their own that we're going to end up by dealing with the issues of that. And that's what a genuine institutional economics would be. And then finally, what's the implications of that genuine institutional economics for a reconstruction of the liberal project in this day and age? And what I try to argue at the, end of the, at the end of the book is the argument in this time against right wing authoritarian populism, left wing authoritarian populism, to try to make a full throated defense of the cosmopolitan liberal order. And that Hayek is at the foundation of that to be able to do it. So he doesn't miss out in, in that project with respect to any other major thinker like Sen or anyone else. You can build on Hayek for that project into the future. And I hope that many of you will join up into doing that. With that, I'm going to sit down and let the, the, the um, uh, panel talk. I just want to once again express my gratitude to uh, Stephanie and everyone for putting this together and for the three of you for taking the time out from your schedules to let's have a conversation about the book and the ideas. So thank you very much. Thanks, Pete. I was going to summarize your book, but I guess I'll do something different uh, instead. <laughs> well, uh, for those of you who've seen the book, if you look on the back, you'll see that I, I wrote a blurb for it. So I am a fanboy, okay? I'm not going to get up here and, and have a lot of criticism of Pete. I'm also in very good company. Israel Kirzner, Vernon Smith are both on the back. But I have to say, um, when first approached... Uh, to write a blurb for the book, I really didn't want to do it, okay? Uh, I figured that, look, there's a number of outcomes and none of them looked very good. The first one would be, great, I really like the book. But of course, I'm writing a book on Hayek. So what am I supposed to say in the blurb? Don't buy this book I've been working on for 10 years? Buy Pete's book? I could say that, but I wouldn't want to say that, okay? So this would not be a good outcome. Alternatively, I could hate the book, right? I could say this is, this is just a crummy book. Um, do I want to say that to Pete? I've known him for 30 years. And besides, everyone would say, 
Sure he's gonna say that. He's writing a book on Hayek. So I'd look bad. So, you know, Pete is big on Venn diagrams, right? And, and two by two matrices to try to get it. So I was looking at the Venn diagram for me doing a blurb on the book. And the, 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 the part that comes out good for me is like vanishingly small, right? So I don't commit right away. I say, look, why don't you send me the manuscript? Let me have a look at it. Luckily, they did. I looked at it. I said, great. Uh, the vanishingly small thing actually grew in size. Because I am doing a book on Hayek as an historian of economics. And Pete, and I'm, I think you got this from, from Pete's presentation, he's actually a social theorist working within the Hayekian tradition broadly defined. And the books don't compete. If anything, they complement each other. But really, they're in two very different domains. So uh, I'm very glad to have, uh, have written that blurb. And you know, I did like the, the book a lot. Um, because it made me actually realize something that you can see just by looking at this room. Uh, the people who are watching this on some sort of video may not get a sense of it, but yeah, this book captures, I think, why this place is such an exciting intellectual place. I've always thought it was. It was before all of this started to you know, appear, and then I became really envious, okay? Uh, but it, it's, it's just a, it's a marvelous place for bringing together lots of different ideas. And I think that's what, what Pete has done within the book. Um, so I'm going to give you three reasons why I like the book, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to my, to my co-conspirators here. Now, the first reason is, uh, the book is the book is like being in a conversation with Pete, okay? Now... There's some snickering in the audience, okay? I don't know if any of you listened to the, the, the podcast about the book where, where Rosalino is, is interviewing Pete, and, and they're going back and forth initially, and then Pete starts to kind of get into, a, into the flow, you know? And, and then right at the very end, poor friggin' Rosalino goes, and, blah, 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 and I've never heard any but he speak that fast because he knew he had his opportunity to get something. So that's not the way that I mean that this is like having a conversation with people. Okay? I didn't want to be misunderstood because I know that that's the way some people are going to think of it. Um, really, what I meant by the phrase is if you think about just the way Pete set this up here, but also in general when you have a conversation with Pete, he is within this Austrian Hayekian Misesian, however broadly or narrowly you want to define a tradition, but he's bringing in Adam Smith and Hume. He's bringing in Buchanan and Tulloch and Buchanan and Wagner and Buchanan alone. He's bringing in Coase. He's bringing in lots of different thinkers, people who are in this room, but people who have long since departed, and he's weaving this stuff together. And what's always interesting to me when I have a conversation with Pete is how his mind is just jumping all over the place in a way that I can't, okay? I'm an historian, I'm saying, what happened on that particular uh, you know, semester in 1932 when Hayek was making this change? That's a very narrow project. Pete is weaving together all these different things and he's quite willing to you know, take stuff from places that you know, no one would ever think uh, to bring it in. So that's one way in which um, uh, it very much reflects Pete, but it also reflects the tradition that I was trying to describe I think that uh, has grown up here. Uh, let me just take a look. Okay, he mentioned epistemic institutional. Another thing is Pete always is making up these phrases, you know, <laughs> which are useful phrases, but it's hard to keep up. I, I still, between mainline and mainstream, I, I always get them mixed up. I get them mixed up, but that's me. That's me. Um, I actually like robust political economy, which is a phrase that you were using a few years back, uh, and I think that that's another way any way of, of trying to capture this project. Okay, a second uh, reason I really like the book is that he attempts to correct errors that are made, I think, uh, uh, anyone who, who's worked in the tradition knows. Lots of people want to dismiss it, so they attribute to it ideas that no one holds, basically. And he actually summarizes these in an early chapter, but what's rich about the book is that he picks up on this in various parts in the book. And I won't, I won't, you know, I want you, I want, like Pete, I want you to buy his book, okay? So I'm not going to give you uh, uh, too much description, but, you know, one of them, uh, 
is where he talks about uh, knowledge versus information, the way that information is treated in mainstream economics versus the way knowledge is treated within uh, the Austrian mm -hmm. tradition broadly defined. I, w I always say broadly defined when I talk about Austrian tradition to include all these other, other people and groups that, that pe weaves in there. Um, that it's not just an appreciative theories when the Austrians talk about knowledge. It's not just an input into mathematical formalization. Uh, rather, it's a different way of looking at things. And there was actually a very nice contribution in Econ Journal Watch uh, uh, with Dan Klein uh, edits on knowledge versus information, getting a number of different people to contribute to that. But I think that this is an, this is an issue that has still not obviously been appreciated. It's, it certainly also came up when, I guess it was the 40th uh, Nobel, 40th anniversary of Hayek's Nobel, when you had the uh, Kirzner and then a number of other Nobel Prize winners, uh, Vernon and, and others. And you know, just the difference between the way the mainstream economists were understanding what Hayek was doing and the others was, was, was really quite profound. Another, another part, I mean, I'm, I'm a, a person who did the, the, uh, the editor's introduction to The Road to Serfdom, and I really appreciated you know, making the point that this is, Hayek's was not a slippery slope argument, but I think what, what, I, what I really liked about your treatment of it was you made the argument that he, he, it was an indeterminate instability argument, uh, which was, a, a, you know, I read that and I thought, yeah, that's right. You know, he actually, yeah, I was always saying, well, it's not a slippery slope, but I wasn't saying what it was. And I think you actually have captured in, in many ways what, uh, what he was trying to do there. Um, there was another, <coughs> one, of the, one of the points that comes from that, and this is a quote from the book, economic uh, patterns are not invariant to institutional context, and certainly you just made that point when you're talking about present value formulas, which I've never been able to figure out anyway. Even if we had the, all the institutions in place, I still couldn't do one very well. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, there was another great illustration in the book from Buchanan. Uh, Buchanan talking about, you know, how is it that people in the East Bloc countries, you know, they just, they've lived under communism, but they still tend to hate markets, you know, and they're not trustful of markets. And he says, well, think about, think about the institutional context in which markets appeared to them. Uh, you're talking black markets where there's only a few suppliers and they're setting the prices, and you can take it or leave it, and that's the only way you're going to get this special stuff. It's like dealing with a monopolist or a cartel. So that's, if that's your experience of what a market is within that particular institutional context, you're going to have certain, you're going to take away certain viewpoints about that. The final bit is something that he didn't talk too much about here, um, and it's that chapter 10. Chapter 10 was my favorite uh, chapter, a reconstruction of the liberal uh, project. And a, a, another Pete-ism, you know, we, we heard Giuliani say truth is not truth. Well, Pete says liberalism's liberal. And actually, it's, sorry, it's sad that you actually have to say that today, but if you, th if you put in the word neoliberalism, you'd have, you know, 90% of academics saying, of course neoliberalism isn't liberal. You know, it's, it's this horrible, horrible thing that, that emerged somehow. And I think that, um, well, I'll just put it bluntly. There's a, there's a number of books that are out there, many of them have neoliberalism in the title, but not all of them, uh, that talk about li these liberal economists and their ideas. And sometimes it's dealing specifically with them, sometimes they're peripheral to the story, and so it's, it's a larger story. But often they are represented as being anything but liberal, and indeed being racist and you know, providing uh, ammunition to the alt-right. And, and, and Pete, in a very nice footnote, footnote seven of that chapter, calls out some of the people who are affiliated with parts of the Austrian tradition and saying, look, if, if you are view this, the importance of this tradition as being simply to say, I can say whatever I want, and I've got freedom of speech, so you can't call me out on that, and I can take the most obnoxious view uh, possible, and you can't call me out on that that that's not the essence of the tradition. The tradition is something that um, actually comes through in a book that I wrote another blurb for, <laughs> okay? Uh, Quinn Slobodian has a book called Globalist. And I said, the blurb, I said, this is the best book on neoliberalism I've read. And it was true, and that shows you how many bad books <laughs> there are in neoliberalism out there. So I was actually telling the truth there. But the reason that I like the book, actually, I, I read the manuscript for... Harvard University Press before it was published, and gave him a lot of uh, uh, things that I would have said differently. But what I said 
in my reader's report was, you know, his, his villains are my heroes, okay? That these Austrians that were writing uh, after empires had collapsed, after World War I, were trying to say, how do we avoid the sort of populist misery that is emerging in all these different countries, sometimes from the left, sometimes from the right, but horrible. And they were saying, well, cosmopolitan liberalism is a way of trying to integrate countries and avoid some of these awful things. And I think that message obviously is quite alive today, or important uh, to, to promote today, and has to push back against the people who are trying to portray liberalism as somehow some sort of uh, a perverse ideology, because I actually think it's it's uh, one of the few hopeful signs that we can look at in this day and age. So thank you, and thanks, Pete, for writing a great book. Hello, um, I'm Sandra Peart. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. <laughs> I want to thank you for inviting me, um, and and uh, I too am a fan of this book. So I will not be saying uh, um, it offering uh, deep criticisms of it. In fact, I think I'm probably the least qualified to comment on the book, but I do have some things to say uh, and, and would lo am, am thrilled to offer them. Let me just say it's a wonderful book. Um, uh, what it does that I enjoyed is put Hayek in context, uh, both an older historical context and a contemporary context. The basic theme of the book um, the epistemic institutionalism theme, which I had to uh, spend some time ruminating about before I came to understand it, uh, seems to me to be uh, absolutely correct. Um, the great thing about this book and that theme is that it separates Hayek from straightforward institutionalists, but allows us to see why he resonates with institutionalism. Uh, it shows why he resonates with experimentalists. It's, it shows us why he resonates with the Virginia School, but it's not quite any of those, or he's not quite any of those. So it's a very nuanced way, I think, to look at Hayek. Um, my co comments are mostly going to be about this sort of contextualization. Pete stresses that Hayek tried to get 20th century economists to return to their earlier preoccupation with institutions. I agree. Uh, I would say that they, the, however, that they moved away from that interest a little earlier than Pete allows. I agree with Larry White uh, that there was a turn uh, late in the 19th century away from laissez-faire. Uh, to that, I would add that the turn away was the result of economists e increasingly questioning the Smithian presupposition that people are able to make reasonably good choices in whatever institutional framework they operate within. As economists came to question this, they also at the same time came to see themselves over time as better able uh, to see what ordinary people should do. They developed models that prescribed what people should do. And then when they observed that people didn't do these things, they saw those as proof that people were irrational. And they turned away as White and Terence Hutchison before him observed from laissez-faire. That turn is evident in the economics of William Stanley Jevons and in Marshall. Pete writes that classical economists through Marshall, through the early neoclassicals, were all preoccupied with, with change, with thinking about how to find institutions by which people could be induced by their own choices to contribute as much as possible to the needs of others. I agree with, with Pete uh, that Marshall has a lot to say about what happens by way of adjustment, but I think that he, like Jevons, has an idea that the theorist is superior and needs to design institutions that bring people into equilibrium. So for instance, Marshall recognized variations in the rate of impatience among consumers with a clear presumption on his favor, on his part in favor of uh, prudence. Um, he writes about variations in t uh, rates of time preferences, time preference um, uh, influencing savings rates and consumption patterns. Uh, so here's a quote from Marshall. Uh, people buy things, uh, he would like them to buy things which will be a lasting source of pleasure rather than those that will give a, a stronger but more transient enjoyment. To buy a new coat rather than indulging in a drinking bout or to choose simple furniture that will wear well, rather than showy furniture, which will soon fall to pieces. You can see where the theorist is. He's got a clear idea of what people should be doing. And the key problem that emerges at about this time is that 
uh, economists come to see some people, some groups of people, as being uh, particularly susceptible to these flaws. Uh, and so the story becomes racialized. The laboring classes are said to be particularly susceptible to high rates of time preference, to drinking bouts, and so on, uh, and sub suboptimal rates of savings. And then, of course, there are policy implications of this, and this is where the key contrast between Betke's Hayek, and I would put Buchanan in there as well, and early neoclassicals comes in. For Hayek, fallibility of people is okay. The idea is that they are to learn within various institutional arrangements. For the early neoclassical economists, however, the theorists who know better must ensure that inferior people, and keep in mind this is groups of people, poor people, or uh, former slaves, or Irish people, or whatever, uh, uh, must ensure that those people optimize. So we must educate. We must ensure that they buy the proper furniture. In the words of the eugenicist Sidney Webb, we must interfere, interfere, interfere. So that's the context in which the turn away from laissez-faire uh, occurs. In Pete's view, formal um, 1930s sort of style of former e formal economics assumes away imperfections and frictions and institutions. I agree, but I would put the case just a little bit differently. Economists in this tradition, or at least ask you to kind of think about adding something to the story, they solve the former formal problem and then they invoke irrationality as the explanation for observed deviations from the optimum. They also invoke the need to design to design policy to move people from these so-called suboptimal rates. So when Bat, ba, while Bator does state, as Pete says, that they have antiseptically removed institutions, uh, they, they push uh, rules and institutions in through the back door. All of this is to say that I, I think Pete is absolutely correct that the orthodoxy worried less than, uh, this is, uh, less than Smith did through uh, John Stuart Mill. And Mill is a key pivotal, pivotal fig figure here, I think, about the process of getting toward an equilibrium or the institutional framework within which those movements occurred. Um, Pete says Hayek was trying to get economics back to its uh, Smithian process-oriented roots, and I agree with that, but I think they lose the roots earlier than Pete uh, would uh, has argued. Pete, uh, Pete's also correct to point to the few who resisted this turn, uh, Buchanan, Alcyon, and Coase. Law and economics and public choice, at least of a certain so type, have much in common with the Hayek and Pete's book. Pete mentions Koopmans uh, in, this, in his book, and I want to expand a little bit of on that because I think it, it helps kind of flesh out the story. Uh, and it's important because Koopmans then ties to the early Virginia school. So, well, he doesn't, but his, his counterpart in the debate does. So. Uh, I'm going to use Koopmans and Vining, Rutledge Vining, uh, as his foil. Uh, I mean, they have a debate. Uh, um, the story reinforces that they have something uh, significant in common, the Virginia School with Hayek. Vining insisted that the statistical techniques used by Koopmans to, to impose a model on, a, on the data were unwarranted. More than this, uh, it was no longer straightforward to conclude that observed choices represent failures in optimization. Um, in this respect, I, I further suggest, and I think this is in line with Pete, that the contrast is between Hayek and the Virginia School on the one hand and the orthodoxy on the other. Um, so uh, I'll just read a little bit from this debate. Uh, the debate concerns the desirability of imposing a theoretical economic model on data for estimation. While the question of uh, whether you can impose markets or institutions on people is interesting, the question on, uh, of whether you can impose a theoretical model, economic model on data is obviously less narrow, but I think the two actually share something in their structure. So Koopmans opens the debate um, uh, in a 47 article measurement without theory, in which he assumes that the economic theory is complete, uh, it's correct, and it's unchanging and it forms the optimal basis then for uh, econometrics. He attacks the statistical procedures of the NBER for being atheoretical. Um, for his part, Vining replied using words like discovery and search in his response. He writes, and this is 49, the work of Burns and Mitchell that is being criticized pur purports to be a work of discovery 
and hypothesis seeking, and it is not clear at all what meaning should be given to efficiency in this context. Statistical efficiency is an attribute of an estimation and testing procedure rather than a, a procedure of search. Discovery has never been a field of activity in which the elegance of conception and equipment is of prime consideration. Finding uh, further suggested that there's more to the study of economics than the sum of individual optimizations. I think, uh, he writes, that we need not take for granted that the behavior and functioning of this entity can be exhaustively explained in terms of the motivated behavior of individuals who are particles within the whole. It is conceivable, and would, it would hardly be doubted in other fields of study, that, it, that the aggregate has an existence apart from its constituent particles and behavior ca characteristics of its own, not deducible from the behavior characteristics of the particles. Sounds very much like a sort of Hayekian way of proceeding. I thought it was very interesting that you had mentioned Koopmans. Koopmans, in turn, responded with an appeal to methodological individualism. Uh, but his, there's a footnote uh, to this article, this is a 49 article, that really kind of gives away the game to Robbins uh, and uh, to Vi Rutledge Vining and the Virginia School uh, economists. It is true, he writes, that so this is a footnote, right? This isn't what he's on about it, but it's a footnote. Um, so sort of trying to preempt uh, a criticism of what he's doing. It's true that the choices of individuals are restrained by a framework of institutional rules, enforced or adhered to by, by the government, the banking system, and other institutions. These rules, tax schedules, reserve requirements, et cetera, can to some extent be taken as given for the analysis of economic fluctuations. In a deeper analysis, these rules and changes in them would need to be explained further from choices by which in, uh, individuals interacting in various degrees of association with each other through political processes. The response is, uh, essentially, as I say, concedes the significance of the institutional setting, at least in the long run, to vining. So I've stressed these points because um, as I said at the beginning, they're important for the determination of policy, of what, if anything, is to be done. And they're important for thinking about where the theorist is relative to the persons being theorized about. If observed choices do not represent failure, there's, there's um, much less warrant to devise, devise policy recommendations for interventions to fix people. Instead, it fell to the political economists to study and try to make sense of people's choices uh, to proceed as, as Betke's Hayek did. What's so important about Pete's book then is it, in, it interrogates the key dividing factors between Hayek um, and orthodox economists. For Hayek, and I would put the Virginia School economists at least um, for this purpose uh, in the same uh, role, one tries to make sense of people's choices in the context of epistemic institutionalism. For the orthodoxy, one solves an optimization problem, and then if observations don't correspond with that, people need to be fixed, corrected. But there's an additional point that I wanted to mention. Mises, and before him Mill, and I think this is why Mill is a key dividing line, made the great point that given the present moral state of individuals, of people, socialism would not work. I think what Hayek added to this, and Pete rightly emphasizes the point in, in the chapter on Hayek and market socialism and the false promise of socialism and the road to serfdom, is the further Smithian and Humean point that even if the bulk of persons were morally developed uh, enough for socialism, there's still a problem associated with expertise. The dangers of placing power in a particular group of es experts, policy wonks, policy makers, politicians, rulers. As Pete puts it near the end of the book, true liberalism is a subtle and nuanced expert critique of rule by the experts. Um, and as someone who's written on experts, I think you know, this is a problem that we really need to pay more attention to. This is why I believe it's no accident that the turn away from presuming people will find their best way forward happens with attacks on John Stuart Mill. This was an attack on the so-called rationality of people that was part and parcel of the turn away um, uh, turn away from this notion of expertise. As biologists, anthropologists, and economists uh, became increasingly convinced that they knew better, they knew the way, they then devised uh, ways to, s to induce so-called rationality. As Pete put it late in the book, this was fundamentally illiberal. 
It presupposed that some experts were better at choice than others. I'll leave it at that. It's a wonderful book. Bruce and Sandy have both been very nice. <laughs> I'm going to be nice too. Um, the temptation when reviewing a book is of course to talk about the one that you, the reviewer, would have written, for which the person who actually wrote the book wasn't wise enough to write themselves. I'm going to try very, very hard not to succumb to that temptation. In other words, I really want to try and engage in some kind of imminent critique of Betke's Hayek. I want to try and consider it on its own terms and see how well it succeeds in fulfilling at least some of the goals that have been set out by its author. I very much doubt that I'll succeed entirely in that endeavor, but I'd like to think that Pete will agree at least that I'm trying. So, what is Betke's goal? Yes, I've read the preface. Um, he says, and I've read the rest of the book too, twice. Um, the book we're told is the story of the evolution of a perspective, and its ultimate objective is to highlight the evolutionary potential of Hayek's ideas. By which Pete means what his ideas still have to say to us in our context and our times. And as you've heard, Pete's principal claim is that there's a common thread running through Hayek's entire oeuvre in economics and political philosophy. That, of course, is the commitment to epistemic institutionalism. And that's the key analytical concept that Pete uses uh, both to give his account of Hayek's intellectual development uh, and also to talk about its evolutionary potential. I really should say at the outset that there are lots and lots of interesting and attractive features of Pete's approach. His overall account of epistemic institutionalism as the Hayekian research program is compelling. His discussion of the, or his use of the notion of appreciative theory, I think, is insightful and really helpful. His discussion of the rule of law as a bulwark against interventionism is insightful. His excoriating critique of what he refers to as litmus test libertarianism, which, as Pete puts it, celebrates not the liberal virtues, but the right of the individual to be closed, to reject, and to be intolerant, that, I think, is powerful and extremely timely. The same is true of his criticisms of populism. But what I want to do in what follows is to highlight and explore some of the points where I think that Pete's arguments could be strengthened the better to try and achieve the goals that he wants to promote. So there are three main points that I want to make. The first concerns the interpretive strategy that Pete adopts, and it's up there on the OHP, and what the approach involves, we're told, is Hayek's version of institutional economics must be read back in an explicit way into his early writings. Now that certainly brings considerable advantages. Not the least of them is that it enables Becky to identify a really strong narrative thread, centering on the notion of epistemic institutionalism that runs right through his account of Hayek's intellectual career. But that interpretive strategy, I think, also comes at a bit of a price. And the reason is that by placing so much emphasis on epistemic institutionalism as that common thread, by reading it back into Hayek's work, I think this approach tends to flatten out Hayek's intellectual trajectory perhaps more than is warranted. What I mean by flattening out uh, is that it makes it harder than it might otherwise be to acknowledge the extent to which Hayek's understanding of the epistemic role of institutionalisms displays what you might term an upward trajectory. It involves Hayek developing his ideas and it yields new insights over a more extended period of time than is perhaps readily apparent uh, from Pete's narrative. I should say, by the way, there is nothing in what I'm going to say that Pete doesn't already know. Um, he knows all this. My point is more an issue of selection and emphasis. So to illustrate the point that I want to make, I want to consider one of the misconceptions about Hayek that Pete seeks to dispel. And that's the idea, and here I quote from page four, the idea that Hayek effectively abandoned economics after the publication of the pure theory of capital, in other words, in the early 1940s, and retreated to political theory, legal theory, and public intellectual work. I should say I completely agree with that interpretation, that, that, that Pete should try and dispel that particular line of uh, interpretation of Hayek. But my concern lies more with the way in which Pete's interpretive strategy 
makes it harder than it would otherwise be for him to explain to his readers precisely how and to what effect Hayek continued to do economics in the 1950s and the 1960s. So my point in a nutshell is that it's only in his post-1960 work, uh, work that is ostensibly about political philosophy and legal philosophy, but really contains lots of interesting economic insights. It's only then that Hayek actually provides his most convincing account of how economic order is possible in societies characterized by an elaborate division of labor and an elaborate division of knowledge. It's only then, in other words, in that later work that he really solves the problem that he posed in his 1937 article on economics and knowledge. Now, of course, as every schoolboy and schoolgirl knows, Hayat made a major contribution to solving that problem in his 1945 article on the use of knowledge, where he talked about the epistemic role of relative price signals. But as my former colleague in Cambridge, Steve, Fleet, Steve Fleetwood, has argued, and as Karen Vaughan, uh, uh, one of the people to whom this book is dedicated, has also argued in her super uh, 1999 article on Hayek's, epistemic, Hayek's implicit economics, it's only later, it's only in his post-1960 writings that Hayek really develops his fullest account of how social order is possible. It's in those later works that Hayek argues that the dissemination of knowledge required for plan coordination is facilitated not just by price signals. It's also facilitated, facilitated by the system of formal and informal social rules. By facilitating enforceable contracts, those rules, of course, help to reassure people that the contributions that they need from other people, if their own plans are to be brought to fruition, will actually be forthcoming. So those rules are an important source of the knowledge that facilitates plan coordination. They work in conjunction with the knowledge provided by relative price signals. And the clearest quote that I can think of where this comes out, this is from the Mirage of Social Justice. Hayek says, what reconciles the individuals and knits them into a common and enduring pattern of society is that they respond in accordance with the same abstract rules. What enables them to live and work together is that in the pursuit of their individual ends, the particular monetary impulses which impel their efforts, so there's the reference to relative prices, are guided and restrained by the same abstract rules. So that's Hayek, I think, giving his fullest account of how order is possible. And rules work cheek by jowl with relative prices in serving the epistemic function. Hayek himself acknowledges this. He says, and this is from Kinds of Rationalism, it's only through a re-examination of the age-old concept of freedom under the law that I have reached what now seems to me to be a tolerably clear picture of the nature of the spontaneous order. Now, Pete knows all this. He hints at this in the book. But I don't think he makes as clear as he might the fact that far from simply drawing out the implications for political and legal philosophy of an already complete analysis of order, one that was complete in the 1940s. It's really in Hayek's post-1960 work that he refines and develops significantly his account of plan coordination. As Peter said, um, the second stage of Hayek's intellectual journey centers on his abuse of reason project. Uh, and Pete uh, gives a really nice account there of Hayek's work on scientism and how he draws a distinction uh, in the 40s and the early 50s between natural and social science. But what Pete doesn't really get to grips with in the book, though he knows it and he mentioned it just a few minutes ago, is that Hayek's views on those matters underwent a significant change in the 1950s when he ceased to draw that sharp distinction between the study of the natural and the social world and replaced it instead by a distinction between the study of simple and complex systems. Now, I think those ideas are not just of peripheral or marginal interest for Pete's project because the notion that society is a complex system informs and shapes Hayek's efforts in the 1960s and thereafter to conceptualize the very issue that lies at the heart of his epistemic institutionalism, namely the relationship between social rules and the possibility of plan coordination and social order. What Hayek ultimately comes to argue is that the capacity to coordinate people's plans, the order of actions, as he puts it, is best conceptualized as an emergent property of the entire complex system of rules that governs people's activities. Now, in the written form of this, I try and give a number of reasons why I think it, Pete really ought to have recognized this. But the one I want to emphasize in this talk um, concerns something by which Pete sets considerable store, namely the scope for Hayek's work to contribute to future research. And my point is a simple one. 
If you look at the ways in which Hayek's ideas have been appropriated by interesting and important and influential social scientists and political philosophers recently, quite often, not always, but quite often, uh, it's been his work on complexity upon which these scholars have drawn. There's a recent article in The Economist just two or three weeks ago uh, which lauded complexity economics as an interesting and important approach. It mentions Hayek as one of, his, of one of its earlier exponents. And here is just a list of what I think of as being really interesting and important work that has used Hayek and in particular used his work on complexity theory. Now let me be clear what I'm claiming when I mention this. I'm not suggesting that Hayek's work on complexity is the most important element of his work or the one with the greatest evolutionary potential. There are many candidates for that accolade, and I don't suppose that the work on complexity theory would come near the top of everyone, or indeed anyone's list. But I submit that this work is important enough to warrant more attention than Pete gives it. If this is a book which is gonna guide people uh, by giving an account of the evolutionary potential of Hayek's work, it really should have mentioned this, and I don't think it gives enough attention to it. One last point. And this final point comes to what I agree with uh, the other commentators. is one of the best chapters in the book, one of the later chapters in the book, where there's, the, there's a discussion of the future of liberalism. So when Becky is explaining Hayek's institutional term and how it came about in the 1930s, he focuses, in a way understandably, on the work of Keynes and the work of the advocates of market socialism. But in doing so, I think Pete ignores or doesn't give enough attention to another really important debate over liberalism that was taking place in the 1930s and 1940s. Uh, and that's the debate within liberal circles over the nature and the future of that doctrine. So in Hayek's opinion, a major reason for the decline of liberalism lay in the way that uh, that doctrine had become all too readily associated and described by its defenders as an essentially negative doctrine. One that was concerned principally with highlighting the shortcomings of government activity rather than identifying the positive role that state action should play. Now, what's in, this is a, a quote uh, from Pete's book. And Pete quotes this in support of his claim that neoclassical economists had neglected institutional analysis. But what's interesting, I think, is if you go back and look at this quote in context. If you do that, and it's taken from The Road to Serfdom, page 87, if you do that, it's clear that in that section of the road to serfdom, Hayek is concerned at least as much with criticizing the attitudes, not of Keynes, not of the market socialists, but of some of his fellow liberals, who he believed had reduced liberalism to a negative doctrine, centering on that presumption against government intervention. So if you look at the start of the section from which this passage is chose, you found this. He says it's important not to confuse opposition against central planning with a dogmatic laissez-faire attitude. The liberal attitude is in favor of making the best possible use of the forces of competition, not an argument for leaving things just as they are. You need a carefully thought out legal framework if you're to make competition work effectively. So the problem for liberalism in Hayek's eyes was that some of its advocates had neglected this positive aspect in favor, as Hayek puts it, of passively accepting existing institutions as they are. Probably nothing has done so much harm to the liberal cause, Hayek argues, as the wooden insistence of some liberals on certain rough rules of thumb, above all, the principle of laissez-faire. So in attempting then to try and explain why Hayek made his institutional turn, I think it's important not just to consider, as Pete does, the importance of responding to neoclassical economists and market socialists, not just the importance of responding to Keynes, but also to explore how Hayek had come to believe that the revival of liberalism need, required its supporters to think a lot more about the positive role of the state. And this is not an isolated theme. You see this in freedom in the economic system, you see this argument in the trend of economic thinking, and you see it, for example, in Hayek's lecture on free enterprise and competitive order uh, in one of the early sessions of the first Mont Pelerin Society meeting. Hayek argues there that it was necessary for liberals to depart from the view that freedom of contract was sacrosanct since some freely made contracts could reduce competition. And he said that they also needed to consider how to reform corporate law, the law of patents, and labor law, all of which he believed had fostered monopoly power. This isn't, I think, just a historical point, and this is the note on which I'll end. 
One of Pete's goals is to rebut the charge that Hayek was categorically opposed to government action. I think it's fair to say that had Pete mentioned more of this, it would have been easier to rebut that charge. Pete also wishes to convince readers that the Mont Pelerin Society, and I quote, was never a Davos for neoliberal economists, but has always been a debate and discussion society concerned with foundational issues facing the liberal society. I think it's clear that discussing the kind of issues I've just mentioned would have made it easier for Pete to make that account. So I think that a discussion of Hayek's views about the shortcomings of liberalism uh, as it had come to be expressed in the first three decades of the 20th century uh, and in his belief for the liberal, that liberals needed to discuss the positive role of the state, the positive aspects of liberal thought, I think that would have enhanced Pete's efforts to promote both of those goals. The note on which I'll end is that, as you may tell, I've spent quite a lot of time reading this book, um, and uh, the fact that it's grappled, grabbed so much of my attention must say something uh, about what a good book it is. So thank you very much indeed. <laughs>